Have you ever wondered what people used to write with before modern pens and printers? You might have started thinking about a fountain pen or a quill, but what I find most fascinating is what we used for the ink itself. One of the oldest and most iconic inks is called Iron Gall ink, and it was used for centuries to write everything from medieval manuscripts to the US Constitution. In today's video, I'm gonna show you how you can make this historic ink yourself, right down to making your own iron sulfate. Now to get started, the first thing you're going to need are a couple of these weird woody growths called oak galls. Although it might look like it, these aren't the fruit of some weird plant, and are instead formed when a type of female wasp lays her eggs inside of a developing oak leaf. The larva then secretes a fluid that basically modifies the leaf so that it forms a protective knobby growth around the wasp as it develops. These growths are extremely high in something called tannins, which are plant-based polyphenols that give our ink its chemical backbone. To extract the tannins, I simply crushed a few of these oak galls and then boiled them in water for about 30 minutes. During this time, the majority of the water-soluble tannic acids were dissolved into the water, and so at this point, I simply allowed the mixture to cool and then passed it through a coffee filter to remove the insoluble plant material. This left me with a dark brown solution of tannin extract, which is one of the two ingredients for my iron gall ink. As a quick side note, I did think at first that the cloudiness of the tannin mixture was due to tiny bits of plant material in the extract, and so I did try passing some of it through the centrifuge at 5000 RPM to clean it up. However, this did absolutely nothing, and so I'm gonna guess that some amount of cloudiness is normal. Anyway, now that I had tannin, it was time to make our other ingredient, iron 2 sulfate or green vitriol as it was called. Now, if you want to be technical, any iron 2 salt would work here, but iron 2 sulfate works particularly well as it doesn't readily oxidize and crystallizes a lot easier. To make iron 2 sulfate, or ferrous sulfate, I decided to react steel wool and sulfuric acid. This mimics how people in the past might have used rusted iron or nails to create the same compound, but since I'm using steel wool, the process is gonna be a lot faster. Steel wool is made mostly of iron, and when this iron reacts with sulfuric acid, it'll form iron 2 sulfate and release bubbles of hydrogen gas. This is a pretty straightforward single replacement reaction, but it's always fun to watch. Now, with respect to my specific procedure here, I decided to simply add some steel wool to a beaker followed by some concentrated sulfuric acid. I then periodically added very small amounts of water, which resulted in a highly aggressive and exothermic reaction. However, this isn't the only way to go about this reaction, or even the best way, depending on what kind of protective gear you have access to. Using room temperature dilute acid would be a lot safer, and I only did it the way I showed here because sulfuric acid creates an immense amount of heat when it's mixed with water, which allowed me to quickly dissolve the majority of the steel wool without needing any external heating. This is again not the safest route by any means, but it's definitely the fastest, and I'm impatient. As a quick final note, it is important here to use project steel wool like the kind you'd get at a hardware store and not stainless steel wool like the kind you'd use for dishes, as stainless steel wool contains chromium, which we do not want. To be fair, any chromium present would probably be removed when this crystallizes, but ideally you just want to take it out of the equation entirely. Anyway, I keep adding steel wool and water until no more dissolves, and this eventually left me with a beaker containing a thick white layer of salt under a dark layer of liquid. The white salt here is an hydrous iron 2 sulfate, and this formed instead of the more recognizable light green heptahydrate because I added water to acid, which again, I wouldn't normally recommend doing. To clean this up, I simply added a large excess of water to form the soluble green heptahydrate, and then passed it through a coffee filter to remove all of the carbon that had separated from the steel. This left me with a beautiful emerald green liquid, which I next boiled down to around a third of this initial volume. I then let it cool down to room temperature before placing it on ice to help crystallize the iron sulfate. Once the iron sulfate did finally crystallize, I did my best to break up the big pieces and then passed everything through my Buchner funnel to collect my pure iron 2 sulfate heptahydrate. Now that I had my two ingredients, it was time for the exciting part, combining the tannins and the iron sulfate. To do this, I first took a few crystals of my iron 2 sulfate and dissolved them in a small amount of distilled water. Once the iron sulfate had dissolved, I next began to slowly add the tannin extract. The moment the two chemicals meet, they immediately form the deep blue ferrous tannate, which is a coordination compound that gives iron gall ink its dark color. 
I went ahead and continued adding the tannin extract until I'd added a roughly equal volume, and after mixing the two thoroughly, my iron gall ink was ready to go. Now, I considered buying a fountain pen and some fancy paper for this demo, but times are tough, and I already had a paintbrush and printer paper, so that's what we got. As you can see here, the ink goes on dark brown, basically the same color as tea. However, as time passes, the complex oxidizes due to exposure to air, which causes it to darken. I found that it takes about 30 minutes to reach its final color, but I assume that varies a lot based on how much ink you apply, and I definitely over applied here. Now, the reason iron gall ink works so effectively as an ink is because the ferrous tannate complex is quite soluble and able to penetrate into the paper. However, this compound will readily react with oxygen in the air, forming ferric tannate or iron 3 tannate, which is completely insoluble. Since this reaction happens within the microscopic fibers of the paper, the insoluble complex ends up thoroughly embedded, making it very permanent. In principle, this is fairly similar to the more modern cyanotyping, which I'll be doing a video on pretty soon, and interestingly enough, is another iron complex. As a few more quick notes, um, since iron gall ink tends to react with oxygen over time, rendering it useless as an ink, most of the time it was mixed just prior to use. Also, dissolved iron 2 sulfate isn't really stable without excess sulfuric acid, which wouldn't really be good for the paper. Secondly, if you want to make this stuff to create some serious artwork or writings, I would strongly recommend adding some gum arabic or some similar binder to the final ink before applying it to the paper. This will help to thicken the ink somewhat and prevent it from excessively soaking into or spreading out on the paper. Thirdly, keep in mind that iron gall ink is corrosive and can potentially degrade certain types of paper, especially when exposed to high heat or humidity. Anyway, now that I'd made a historically accurate iron gall ink, I figured it might be fun to try something different and a bit more accessible. Now, if you're anything like me, you probably don't have oak galls just lying around. However, many common food products contain some amount of tannins, with black tea having a particularly high concentration. With that in mind, I decided to test how the more readily available black tea could work for making gall ink, and luckily I happened to accidentally buy this otherwise completely useless decaf. To extract the tannins from the tea, I began by cutting the bags open, pouring out the contents into a beaker, and then pouring in some boiling water. After allowing this to steep under constant stirring for about 30 minutes, I next filtered off the tea leaves and boiled down the filtrate to around a third of its initial volume. This left me with what is basically just super concentrated tea, although it's still a little too weak for drinking in my opinion. Anyway, at this point, I simply used the tea extract the same way I'd used the tannin extract before, and the results were actually pretty similar. The main difference with using tea is that the final ink lacked any tint of blue that was so clearly present in the classical version. It was also overall just not quite as dark, and so while I wouldn't use this version for any serious artwork, it could definitely be fun to try given it's so much more accessible. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. I hope you found this interesting, and as always, I want to thank all my incredible members here on YouTube for their generous contributions. Your support is vital and very appreciated. To everyone else, if you'd like to see more content like this, don't forget to subscribe and let me know in the comments what other chemistry projects you'd like me to try next. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.